Hi, everyone. My name is Sanaz Eftakari. I'm the Vice President of Research for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. I'm joined by a few members of AFA's Medical Scientific Council, including Dr. Mitchell Grayson, Dr. Matthew Greenhot, and Dr. David Stukas. Um, thank you guys for joining us. We're here to talk about the COVID-19 vaccine, and we appreciate you guys sharing your expertise with our community. So Dr. Grayson, I'm going to start with you. Uh, the FDA is currently reviewing the safety and efficacy data for the Pfizer vaccine, and they'll start the review for the Moderna vaccine on December 17th. When do you think we could expect one or both vaccines to be approved? And when do you think we could expect the vaccine to be available to the public? So, uh, so Naz, thanks. And it's great to be here. Um, you know, as we're talking, the FDA advisory committee is actually meeting on the Pfizer vaccine. Um, I would expect that th there'll be a vote today. I would suspect they will approve it or vote to approve it. I, I would think the FDA will approve it within a day, to be honest with you, give what, what is actually an emergency use authorization. It's not actually a true um, approval for the drug, but they, I would think that will happen within a day. I suspect the same thing will happen in a week with Moderna's vaccine. In other words, a week from now, they're supposed to be having the Moderna uh, advisory board meeting, and then I would assume again within a day. Now, that's that's the emergency use authorization. Now you ask, when are we going to start seeing the vaccine? That's a different issue. So um, we know that with the Pfizer vaccine, and I assume this will happen with Moderna, that the first set that we go out with will be healthcare workers and elderly and you know, at-risk populations. That's the first set of vaccine. If you're talking general population, when are you going to see the vaccine? We're probably talking, if we're if we're going to be positive about this, let's say late January or February, I'm being really kind, probably we're looking more March, April. Um, so we have to be sort of cognizant of the fact that we're, there's, there's an approach to this uh, in terms of Operation Warp Speed and how they're getting the, the vaccine out. And we really are trying to get those populations that are most at risk uh, or the healthcare sector vaccinated first. So, so that's going to be a while before people see the vaccine. I think you have to be careful. And, and, and when we talk about other issues related to the vaccine, keep that in mind that a lot of the current issues that we have questions about are gonna be resolved by the time the vaccine fully rolls out to everybody. Great, thank you. Uh, so Dr. Stukas, what do we know so far about the clinical trials for these vaccines? Do we know what the diversity of the people uh, with asthma and allergies uh, who are included in the research? Yeah, and again, thanks for having me. Um, this. The, the transparency behind uh, these trials is amazing. Uh, you know, anybody can log on today to watch the FDA discuss all of this and Pfizer released all their data for everybody to review, anybody to review, I should say. So I just wanna say that, you know, all of this is out there. Um, we don't know specifically how many people had asthma or food allergies or allergic rhinitis or things like that because they didn't break it down by that when they report this. Um, there are other categories that are, are sort of more important in the grand scheme of things to try to figure out whether the vaccine was safe and effective, um, but they weren't excluded. Uh, the only potential allergy that was excluded specifically were those uh, participants who may have had a severe allergic reaction to prior vaccines or any of the specific ingredients contained in this Pfizer vaccine. And of note, and I think we'll talk about this more, the Pfizer vaccine does not contain any food proteins, food allergens, food derivatives. It wasn't grown in embryos, so there's no egg or anything like that. Um, so we have to assume that there were people, you know, these are some of the more common chronic conditions, especially asthma. We have to assume that there were people with asthma and allergic rhinitis and atopic dermatitis and, um, and food allergies enrolled in these trials. Uh, and, and we're not seeing any, you know, big scary signals um, you know, from any group really, uh, so let alone those. Okay, great, thank you. So for the next question, I'm gonna open it up to the group, but start with Dr. Greenhot. So the media has widely reported uh, warnings from the UK that people with the history of severe allergies shouldn't get the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, these warnings were reported due to two people experiencing an adverse reaction to the vaccine, but can you help clear up the information that came out of the UK uh, when it comes to allergies in the COVID-19 vaccine? I, I can try. Um, I, I will say this, this is a fluid and evolving situation. And obviously we're, we're not in the UK and we, we, we don't know everything that happened or, or, or what happened. Um, but, but from what is publicly known that these were two patients who were under the care of an allergy specialist for unrelated conditions, um, each who were prescribed self-injectable epinephrine because they had a risk of anaphylaxis. 
and and these two individuals had um, reactions yesterday after being vaccinated, and you know the details of, of what happened and, and what their response was is, is, are, are not clear. Um, <clears throat> But I, I think, you know, this is a new vaccine, a new vaccine technology, um, slightly different excipients, which we'll, we'll get to in a bit. Um, I, I think that they have taken the strategy to, you know, without knowing who could be at risk to sort of draw a larger circle around a broad group who could be at risk and sort of work back from there. Um, you know, the the issue isn't as much sort of, I mean, vaccine reactions happen all the time. If you look at, if you look at the Pfizer data and the Moderna data, each, both the placebo and, and the um, uh, active arm had a rate of anaphylaxis. Now, it wasn't very high. And certainly, you know, what, what has me scratching my head is we didn't really hear about any of this in, in, in the trial data, but um, you know, now we're in the general population and this is what happens when you move from a trial to real life and, and sometimes surprise, um, but, um, you know, they both reactions happened at a vaccination center where people are equipped to treat a reaction, which is the most important thing. And nobody's going to be getting, nobody's driving by, you know, some sort of vaccines are us sticking their arm out the window, getting a vaccine and off on their way. These are all going to be um, done at a center where we watch every vaccine that's given in the U.S. is given under observation for some period of time. So, you know, we expect that this could happen and this is, you know, we're prepared for this. So this did happen. They're working backwards to figure it out. And I think think, you know, with vaccines in, in short supply anyways, it's just easier to sort of maybe push these people towards the back of the queue, as they would say over there, um, and, and let the people without as much of a potential risk, and we don't even know what it is, and, you know, this is, again, a very broad warning, and, you know, they're saying, you know what, well, let, let's do these guys first, it might be a little bit easier, we'll work backwards towards you, and more will come out, um, you know, for those watching, remember, this is a vaccine that's not indicated for children yet, um, you know, and it's really not going to be available for people right now who are not frontline workers who are at the highest priority and highest risk of exposure. Um, so I, I think more will come out in time. Um, but, you know, you, you do vaccines in centers like this for a reason because you could react and these people were treated and that, that's what you can expect. So. And I, and I think that's a, a good point to make for our community members who aren't involved in clinical trials the same way, obviously, you guys are and um, AFA, we are in, in terms of recruiting for clinical trials. It helps to have a little bit of the kind of background and the context to how these processes work. So really appreciate that. Dr. Stukas or Dr. Grayson, anything to add on that question? Um, yeah, if I may, I think that this just highlights what we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic and the way that information is being spread. Um, uh, <laughs> we, we are caught in this constant news cycle and everybody's on red alert and uh, in, in an effort to get the, the, the headlines out there, sometimes we rush to judgment. So I would just say to everybody, um, you know, it's okay to take a deep breath. <laughs> we need context. We need perspective. We need to verify sources. We need to understand we are missing crucial details uh, that can help guide anything from this point forward. So this just reflects everything we've seen before about uh, miracle therapies and cures and things along those lines. So uh, we have time to sort this out. Uh, we will sort this out and we'll be able to hone things in a little bit more. And oh, by the way, this is just one of many candidate vaccines. So if this one doesn't pan out for whatever reason, we have more coming down the pike. And the only thing I would add to that is there are different technologies so if this does turn to be turn out to be something related to mRNA, well, we have adenovirus, we have protein. There are other ways of making vaccines. They're coming. They're just not the first ones that are out there. So, and and the other thing I would, I would also like triple down on with what Dave said is, unfortunately, twenty four hour news cycles are not helpful here. Um, there's just too much information coming out that is really preliminary and I really would distress to people just take a deep breath and relax. You're not, you know, we're not going to see the vaccine getting out to, to the general public for a while. This will be worked through and we will know who's really more at risk than not. And none of this is unexpected for a, for a vaccine that's a new new technology and a new vaccine being rolled out. So I, I think it's the media likes it a lot more, but it really is this is how medicine is with with the new vaccine. Always can count on you guys to be the voice of common reason. So thank you for that. 
Um, Dr. Greenha, I'm gonna kick it back over to you. Can you talk a little bit about the vaccine ingredients and allergic reactions? Uh, we know that there was a lot of misinformation years ago where it was thought differently years ago about um, people with egg allergy not having to get the flu vaccine, but evidence has proved that the flu vaccine is safe and that there's no longer a reason to skip the flu shot. So do you think there's anything right now, you know, knowing that it's an, it's an evolving situation, but anything you wanna say right now about uh, what people with food allergies should know about the vaccine ingredients or specifically about the COVID-19 vaccine? Sure, I, I, I can say with high confidence that this is going to end up being a situation where this isn't about a food allergy or a food excipient. There, there are no food excipients in this. Um, even the vaccines that have had food excipients in them, um, it, you know, it, it, the, the, the story hasn't always been what we've thought. And I think we, we've learned a lot in the past um, 10 years on, on, on the influenza vaccine uh, situation alone. So this vaccine, it's a nanotech, it's a nanotechnology vaccine. So these are emulsions. Um, they're, they're, they're generally lipid emulsions. So there's a lot of fat. Um, think about your salad dressing layers sort of separating it. That, that's probably not a bad example. I'm not saying this is salad dressing, but you know, it's, it's, it's fatty. Um, and the main ingredient that I think people are suspicious of is something called polyethylene glycol or PEG. Um, you know, this, this is something that's, it, it, we eat this, this is in a decent amount of foods and orally, this doesn't really cause problems. Um, but injecting, um, you know, it, it was the one thing that sort of came up and people zeroed in on that. And we have absolutely no causative data. We have absolutely nothing that says this did or didn't cause it. This is just something like, it, you know, it, it, it's a suspicion, you know, um, and it's being looked at and, you know, it, 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 this is out in the public domain. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not divulging anything confidential here, but uh, so people are looking into that and, and, you know, like, like anything, you will find a case report of almost anything on this planet causing an allergy in somebody. And, you know, that doesn't mean that it's common or that it happens, but I don't see this as a risk for somebody with food allergy. This could be, you know, a, a, a general risk for, for reasons that we don't know. And, and again, that will emerge. Um, but you know, there's no egg, there's no peanut, there's no name, name your vaccine excipient du jour that, you know, somebody has told you you're convinced is the reason why the spike in food allergies is happening or, you know, why Michigan ducked out of the game this weekend. I don't know. I'm sitting with two friends from Ohio state and I was former <laughs> faculty in Michigan. Uh, I was waiting for this to happen anyways, but um, you know, I mean, so there are lots of reasons why people can have a reaction to a vaccine. I mean, some of it can be non-allergic and that's the thing, you know, just because you had an adverse reaction, that's the larger umbrella. And allergy is a specific type of an adverse reaction. It happens through a very specific pathway. To us, that means everything. That's why we test for some things and we say we can't test for other things because there are no tests. That pathway doesn't have a test. So that would be the first part, figuring out what type of an adverse reaction it is. And then zeroing in, okay, is this something that has a specific fit? Like, is there an IgE antibody that, you know, susceptible people have? Or is this something more diffuse? Like if, if you get, you know, contrast media or vancomycin where it's pushed too fast, it just makes your mast cells kind of twitch a little. And, and you know, that, that happens too. And that, that would mean that, that can happen to anybody. It's not a, an allergy risk. And again, we will learn more over the next couple of days. Um, although I would say the vast majority of people, if you're not a healthcare worker, this is not going to apply to you right now. And again, there's not enough vaccine for everybody who wants to get it on day one to get it anyway. It, things are going to emerge. There are other vaccines out there. I think all of them are going to end up in the same general sort of confidence interval envelope of, of, of how they could work. And in the end, you know, you go to the grocery store. I, I'm not brand selective for ginger ale. Any of them will work. And that might be, you know, this, this store sells this and that might be how it is. So for now, I would say just the Aaron Rodgers, relax. Mm -hmm. Somebody can play that clip, you know. But for now, I think, yes, this is not what I think people wanted to hear on day one of the vaccine, but I like everything. I think there's an initial worry. And then once we dig into this, we'll tell you that, you know, this, this A, this is very manageable and B, this is who you needs to worry about it. But with anything with the vaccine allergies, I will say this, there is always a way for somebody who is allergic to a vaccine to get it hundred percent of the time. There may be more hoops that you have to jump through to get it. It may be more logistically difficult, um, but there we can give people things that they are allergic to. And we've been doing that for years. That's why we desensitize. That's why we have protocols. That's why we do things. So we will figure out a way to get this to somebody if there is a risk. 
Yeah, and, and we completely understand that, you know, the first wave of the vaccines obviously are going to healthcare workers and other um, groups, but we just want to make sure we evolve with the information. So thank you with that. Um, Dr. Stukas, switching gears a little bit to asthma, what do we know or what do people with asthma, what should they know about the COVID-19 vaccine? Do you think it's a high priority for people with asthma to get vaccinated? Yeah, you know, um, thankfully, we've had nothing but reassuring evidence uh, since the beginning. Uh, and more and more, you know, uh, studies are being published that shows that asthma by itself, just that diagnosis really isn't a, a big risk factor for those to actually catch COVID-19 or have more severe disease from it. It's just not behaving like other respiratory or viral illnesses that typically trigger asthma exacerbation. So in regards to the vaccine, I don't know. We'll have to see what the FDA says and the, the allotments and things like that. But um, I don't I don't want people with asthma to think that they have to rush out and get it. Um, that being said, uh, asthma is a very chronic condition. And if you have other you know, um, features that place you at high risk based upon your age, um, other um, chronic health conditions that you may have, uh, the work that you do and things like that, that is probably going to come into play much more than just a diagnosis of asthma. Okay, awesome. I think we have one more question, then I'll open it up to the group. Uh, so Dr. Grayson, will the Allergy and Immunology Medical Societies be issuing guidance concerning allergies and who should or shouldn't get COVID-19 vaccinations? So I, I think that's a, a little bit of a loaded question. Um, I think that the allergy societies will defer to what the FDA says, but they will provide some guidance, um, pri probably focused towards the professionals, towards the, the practitioners, not towards the public, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of how to deal with reactions and, and things like that. But the actual who should get the vaccine kind of thing, I don't think you'll see that come from the allergy societies. I think you're going to see that come from the FDA and maybe the larger uh, medical uh, organizations that are, are, are broader than that. Um, you will see information, and in they are putting information out to, to the members about types of reactions and how to treat reactions and that kind of stuff. But uh, in, in terms of the broader picture, who gets, who doesn't get, I don't think you'll see them step into that. Great. Yeah, we expect that the, obviously, like you said, the medical societies will work closely with the FDA um, and the manufacturers to make sure that we're supplying these safely. So with that, I'll open it up. Are there any final thoughts or anything else you guys think that our asthma and allergy community should know so that they can make informed decisions? Again, acknowledging that it's really early and that everything's kind of evolving, but just wanted to open the floor there. Well, I, I do want to say one thing is I, I want people to realize the vaccine, I mean, we've sort of put the vaccine on this pedestal that this was going to be the holy grail that when the vaccine came out, the pandemic would end the next day. Mm -hmm. And, and that is not going to happen. And the vaccine is gonna get out and, 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 and we are still gonna have the virus floating around and we're still gonna have people being hospitalized and we're still gonna have people dying. I, I think it's important to remember that mask wearing, washing your hands, physically distancing is critically important and will remain important even after the vaccine comes out, even after everyone is getting vaccinated um, because these vaccines only reduce the transmission of the, of the disease they don't make it go away. And we still need all of the public health pieces, which we have not done very well at in this country, but we still need them uh, in place to help get us through what's left of this pandemic. So uh, we're, we're, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but it's not a bright light yet. And I think people need to keep remembering that, that this is not gonna end that quickly. Yeah. Matt, I'll give you the last word if that's okay. Um, and I, I, would, I would add in that, you know, we have learned so much about allergic conditions uh, and as board certified allergists and immunologists, we really specialize and quite frankly, enjoy uh, the nuances involved. Um, you are each individuals. Um, and just because you have the same diagnosis as somebody else, it, it may be in completely different management strategies. So uh, we, I think we need to embrace the individualized nature of um, all of these different chronic conditions. And uh, as all of this evolves in regards to the vaccine risk factors and, and that, like Dr. Greenhot said, well, that's what we specialize in. We can find a way to get this done. Um, so hang tight. Uh, things will change. I promise you. <laughs> things will change. So just stay tuned. And then as always, um, talk to your personal allergist, your personal doctor, if you have specific medical questions pertaining to your care. Uh, and be careful what you read online. So this is where I give them your cell phone number, right? So they can call you with questions. They, um, they, already, they already have it. They know how to find me. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I echo everything both 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 Dr. Stick and Dr. Grayson said. I, I mean, I think look, there there are definitely going to be limitations of vaccines, just like everything. Nothing works a hundred percent. Nothing's probably going to work ninety five percent of the time in all populations. Uh, you know, if we get to sixty percent of the time it works all the time, that would be fantastic too. But uh, you know, um, you know. So keep wearing your mask, keep distancing, realize that this vaccine is designed to stop infection from getting into your body and will do nothing to prevent it from being transmitted elsewhere. Um, you know, options are good and that yes, our job is to figure out a way to get something into you safely that your body may not tolerate. Um, and we are very good at treating reactions or hedging the risk or whatnot. And, you know, we'll, we'll get to work on that if this proves what needs to be done. We've done it before. Um, there's just, there's no reason to deny somebody a vaccine that they want because of an allergic condition. We, we can, we can do better for our patients than that. And I think that that's the important thing that that was a strategy that we took a long time ago. We used to contraindicate and, you know, it, we can just evolve around that. And I think we have um, the lessons taught with, with the flu vaccine in the last pandemic and everything like that. I mean, it's gone um, very, very quickly. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're taking different attitudes about ways to, to challenge and to figure things out. And, and you know, we, we will make it work for you. Um, but, you know, I think it's very important that everybody who can, and even some of you who don't want to gets this vaccine, because that's how you get herd immunity. This is now we can talk about herd immunity. Um, you give somebody the vaccine, you put the immunity into them, and then the community is protected. And, um, you know, everybody needs to get it because there will be some people who can't or won't or don't. Well, with that, um, thank you guys so much, Dr. Grayson, Dr. Stukas, Dr. Greenhot, uh, for helping us to tangle the information we have so far. Uh, we know there's a lot more information coming, so we'll reach out to you guys for more information and we'll continue to keep our community updated. So thank you guys.